Hi everyone and welcome tonight. Um, thanks everyone for joining. So to begin with, I, as per usual, will do a sound check. So if anyone can hear me, if you can just type in um, that you can hear us. We were having a little chat before, so if you did sneak in earlier, um, you would have heard us having a little chat. Um, so Shannon can hear us, yep. Rachel can hear. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce Jordan tonight. Jordan's our guest speaker. Um, let me just pop over here and show Yep, I can hear that. you there. Yeah. You, can, you can hear me, beautiful. So yep, let me just... No drama. No, oh, hang on two seconds. I've got to give a little spiel first, Jordan, but I'm just going to change my slide here. There we go. So um, Jordan doesn't know, know about this slide, so I'll just... Um, freeze that for a moment. He probably can't see it, so that's good because um, we've just got a few pictures up of you there, Jordan. So... Oh, okay. <laughs> let me just... Oh, wow. I'm not sure I hope they're good pictures. <laughs> yeah, they're not horrible ones, don't you worry. Um, oh, so, like I said, Jordan's um, going to be presenting tonight. Jordan's a master farrier. Um, he's been qualified uh, in Australia. Um, and he's also qualified with the English Diploma System. Um, he's, he was doing a lot of our corrective farrier work for our clinic, but unfortunately he decided to um, become a traitor and move to Victoria. <laughs> um, he's enjoying the weather down there apparently, but um, it, uh, we're missing him up here. So he's working predominantly with thoroughbreds um, in Victoria, um, but he has specialised um, in all sort of areas of equine work. Um, he's worked with small and large, young and old. Um, from miniatures, we did have him doing um, Chevy up here, so he was loving doing Chevy. Um, and he does a lot of barefoot trimming um, and handmade shoes. Um, which are pretty impressive. We've seen him make them from a um, straight piece of metal, so it was very impressive. Um, so he's come across a lot of, um, you know, all kinds of cases and, and problems, and um, he certainly knows what he's doing. So hopefully um, you'll learn a bit tonight. And he's going to cover um, things like why, um, you know, trimming versus shoeing, um, and why picking your horses' feet out is so important. So, without further ado, I will hand you over to Jordan. Now, we are going to keep questions at the end just so that we don't lose, um, you know, track uh, of train of thought or anything like that. So, I've just got to hit a button here and we'll hand over to Jordan. Inside, you've got the white diagram. Uh, Louise, you can, that's yes. on the same page? Yes, yep. on the same page. Okay, so we'll work. Um, Approximately and work distantly. So you're starting off with the cannon bone that you can see there, which is kind of known from an outsider's perspective as the shin of a horse. Um, and then you've got the uh, ankle joint, the fetlock, and then you've got uh, long pastern, like I was saying, short pastern and pedal bone, known as uh, about three different names, but we'll just simply call them the P1, P2, and P3. P stands for phalanx, and 1, 2, 3 is just a uh, simply labelling them from uh, proximally to distantly. Okay, um, also basically there I'll just describe, you've got an incredibly detailed, uh, ginormous amount of ligaments, tendons and uh, skin and uh, bones and verses and you have digital cushion and then you've got the external hoof wall and frog and horny sole all working together to make up the, uh, the distal limb, and uh, it's there's no muscles whatsoever below the horse's knee, which is known as your carpal bones, or the hind is known as the tarsal bones. There's actually no muscles below there. That's why horses can seem to stand in extremely cold, uh, wet conditions or snow, and their feet don't seem to um, feel the cold so much. There's not so much blood down there. Uh, there's actually just the skin and tendons, and uh, the, most of the blood seems to circulate quite rapidly through the horse's hoof. And uh, that's a, another discussion as to how it keeps the thermal properties so uh, controlled. But uh, basically there, um, you can see at the very back, you've got your superficial flexor tendon running at the, from the proximal eye spec. It'll run right down to the bottom. Superficial flexor will actually, you can't really see this here, but uh, it'll actually bifurcate at about the uh, P2, which is now the short passing joint, and go around to the front. You've got your uh, deep flexor tendon, 
which uh, runs down to the back aspect of your pedal bone. These are your main tendons that I'll go through because you'll hear farriers talk about them with you if they're most, most of the time if a horse is going to bow a tendon or strain a tendon it will uh, strain its deep flexor or no more so if that, that's from overexertion but if it's going to knock itself on a tendon whilst it's under pressure it will be a superficial because the superficial is closer to the skin than the deep because the deep sits a lot deeper since hence the name deep flexor so if there's going to be a big knock from the another hoof maybe it's going to be on the superficial flexor and they're usually who wants to cop the brunt of the uh, injuries actually um, we could talk about the pedal bone there, the bone right down at the bottom, which is encapsulated by your hoof capsule and all kinds of laminar atta attachments and um, things like that. That should always be running quite parallel with your hoof wall. And as the um, as you would have seen, with, uh, if you've seen cases of laminitis, it's actually incredibly unparallel and it starts to separate. Uh, that's an example of when you can tell there's been detachments in the lamina. And that kind of detachments in laminate can happen through uh, flaring of the hoof wall from improper hoof trimming or maintenance from, from your farrier or if you have a farrier and things like that. So from a sagittal section just on the right hand side you'll see at the toe, the toe of the horse's hoof seems to be quite stretched out and you can see quite a little bit of um, lamina tearing at the end of that pedal bone, the swelling there. But that's only my news, but that horse has got what we would call a toe flare. Okay, so through the anatomy, um, at the very bottom there of that bottom right hand diagram, sagittal section of the cadaver leg, the um, two things that I want to show you here is one would be the uh, what we call the horny frog, the frog, basically as you would see it if you pick up your horse's hoof, and that giant brown dark green part is the horse's frog. And that's quite spongy and quite vascular, meaning it's got a lot of blood flow through it. And also just behind that you'll have your digital cushion. And these things are quite imperative to a horse's hoof function because of the uh, basically the, the dispersion of uh, shock or concussion. As, it, as a horse's hoof lands, every time it lands, or even as they rest on it, it's constantly compressing and expanding, which helps to push blood from the uh, arteries through around all the pillory beds of the uh, hoof capsule and push them back up through the ventricles back to the heart because there's no muscles at the bottom of a horse's leg and it's so far away from a horse's heart that um, it actually is imperative that it has this digital cushion to uh, as a way pump the blood from the uh, hoof capsule back up the leg with every step and because of the one-way valves on the, um, that you'll find on your veins, just like us, uh, as it pumps each time, it's slowly moving back up the veins. Um, as a, you, if a horse doesn't actually walk, they'll get lymphatic swelling, as I spoke about earlier with Louise, and uh, the best thing for them is uh, walking, otherwise they seem to swell up because just, there's no blood flow, and it, because of the, there's, there's not enough blood pressure from the heart now, it needs the horse to actually walk around and expanding contracted hooves therefore to push the blood back up its leg. Um, you'll see the hoof wall is the darker part of the hoof wall and then you'll see a grey part and then eventually that will lead to a white part. Now that white part is known as your white line and if you follow it down to the very tip which you can't really see on the picture but that's known as your white line uh, which is pretty notorious because everyone knows it through white line disease but um, apart from that white line disease is the softer part of the junction between the hoof wall and the pedal bone because it's a softer part it's more prone to being eaten by bacteria hence white line disease it will slowly eat up between that wall and that junction and uh, yeah well, I don't know if you've seen white line disease or thrush or, or thrush through the hoof wall or um, a bit of a seedy growth but it can be um, quite severe very severe but um, I think it, most horses seem to have a very, very initial part of white line or a little bit of a seedy growth at their, at their very distal, the terminal papillae we call, right at the bottom of the, where the sole meets the hoof wall. It's, that's a, that might only go in there three or four millimetres and after that the, the laminar is bind so tightly that it doesn't actually get the chance to travel any higher. But um, yeah, we, I get that a lot as a farrier. They say, oh, I'm pretty certain my horse has a seedy toe or white line disease and 
and uh, most nine times, probably a ten times out of ten, but nine point nine times out of ten, it's simply the fact that it's just a, just like your fingernails. You might even looking at mine now because I've been showing horses all day. You might just see a little bit of dirt around your fingernail, and uh, you notice that it doesn't go any further up under your fingernail than that one millimeter or half a millimeter because the the uh, nail is so tightly bound to your skin that it doesn't get the chance to go any further. That's very similar to what you'll find with the, the distal end of the terminal patella taking a tiny little piece of dirt but it doesn't seem to push up any further but if it's left unmaintained it can actually develop a CD toe or a white line disease but if uh, correct trimming and or correct shoeing that you won't have to worry about that. So I think I've covered anatomy quite basically but uh, hopefully it's enough and uh, if there's any, any further questions just leave them and we'll answer them at the end. I'll move to the next slide. Now I thought this would be a great little slide to put in because it's probably one of the most asked questions I get or if we, um, if it's not a question usually it's a statement <laughs> and people will say I, oh, I do not shoe my horse, I, I get it trimmed. Uh, we, we don't shoe horses and they're, they're usually, usually the reason will be they will say because it's unnatural and uh, I, I won't argue that it's definitely unnatural to put a foreign object nailed onto a moving object of, a, of an animal. But uh, it seems to be since the dawn of farriery or shoeing horses, which is about 700 years old now, it's one of the second oldest trade in the world and the oldest, I've only been told that it's the oldest trade, which is prostitution and the second oldest trade, which seems to be the blacksmith or the farrier. So uh, they've always nailed shoes onto feet and we can't seem to find a, a more um, efficient way and also cost effective with the least detriment to the hoof wall than, uh, than nailing them on. Uh, gluing, gluing shoes on seems to be to the detriment of the horse's hoof because as I described earlier, the horse needs, horse's hoof needs to expand and contract and with uh, gluing shoes on it acts as like a plaster cast on your hand and you can't actually move your hands so therefore less blood flow. Just like a horse's hoof, if we glue them on, less blood flow which means less uh, growth and less growth whilst um, the horse is wearing its hoof away with each step, it uh, eventually gets into the soft sensitive area and it will become at a detriment to your horse's feet and then you won't be able to ride your horse and no one, no one will walk away happy at all. So to trim or to shoe, I'll go through the main reasons why I'd say we should shoe and I'll also answer the reasons why we probably won't. Um, now the only reason that we would advise putting shoes onto a horse will be if the horse's hoof is growing slower than it's actually, uh, it's, it's, say the horse's hoof is wearing away faster than it's growing. So um, if you're on abrasive surfaces and your horse's hoof is um, wearing away quite rapidly because maybe he's dragging his toes because he's a bit lazy in his gait or say he's just, he's leaning fine but the abrasive surfaces are wearing away so rapidly which is a prime example of this would be the bitumen. A lot of people ride on the side of the road um, or just on rocky paths in, if you're going out uh, riding through the bush, they all wear away quite rapidly, like they'll wear away the hoof quite rapidly. So I think it's um, it, when it starts to wear away faster than it's growing, that's when you need to think about shoes or you can put uh, boots on, those barefoot boots, but uh, the, the chance of interference for barefoot boots is drastically, uh, it's, 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 it's a lot more because it's like you wearing a a small pair of uh, tightly worn in thongs underneath your feet as opposed to wearing a ginormous big pair of uh, skateboard boots. Eventually you're going to trip on your skateboard boots if you're going to start walking around and moving around quite rapidly. So you're wearing sports runners as opposed to big skateboard boots. That'd be a good way to think about it. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the main reasons why I would shoot and there's a lot of others like confirmation or flaring or imbalanced hoof shape which I will cover later. So the next dot point we got strong thick hoof wall. This is a reason why sometimes we won't shoe. If a horse has strong thick hoof wall and it's growing at, uh, at a healthy rate, I will always advise um, not to shoe because if the horse, is, the horse is better off without shoes on, it's better off without having nails driven through its hoof wall and if it can remain healthily and uh, sound and keeps growing nice thick wall, 
at a rate that it's not wearing away at the faster than it's growing, I'll always recommend that, that it goes uh, barefoot. Even if it can't go barefoot in front, I'd say I'd happily see it barefoot behind. So I have a lot of my clients will wear uh, front shoes on their horse. They won't have hind shoes because their, their hind feet seem to stand up to the wear a lot, a lot stronger. And also the general shape of a hind foot is a lot more um, sturdy. It's, got, it's, it's uh, more pointy, you will have seen, and straighter on the quarters. So it's more of a diamond shape or a tulip. And uh, that's actually no real, uh, no real coincidence. That's actually designed like that through, I suppose, evolution or whoever created the horse. But uh, the, the power comes from the hind feet on pulsion. And these feet are shaped a bit more like pointy diamonds or tulips so that they can actually dig those toes into the ground and propel forward. And the front feet are around a big round, kind of uh, oval, big oval or circular shape on some. And that is literally to keep the front end of the horse out of the ground. They don't actually propel as much with their front feet at all. All the muscle comes from the hind quarters. That's why their feet are shaped like that. Uh, the horse will bear probably 65 or 70 percent of its, or probably 60, 65 percent of its body weight on its its front feet, and uh, the 40 or 35 on its hind. But uh, except for when it's obviously working its hind quarters in whatever discipline it is. But uh, that's why you'll find that a lot of your front feet uh, seem to go a lot flatter than the hind feet because there's just so much weight constantly being pushed through these front feet that eventually the laminar attachments of the uh, hoof wall will slowly stretch off the pedal bone towards the distal end of them. But now I'm getting off track. But that's that's one of the main reasons <laughs> that I would say strong, strong thick hoof wall is ideal and that I wouldn't, if I don't have to, I will always prefer to trim, barefoot trim as they say. <clears throat> now a balanced hoof shape, uh, I'll, I'll just jump forward. So just disregard all the other things you're going to see. But this is to describe balance of shape. So <clears throat> the bottom right-hand corner here, can you see that, Louise? No, you, have, you need to go one. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we've got it. Yep. Yep. Now the bottom right-hand corner, that's just a, a general map of a horse's hoof. And as you can see, the blue dotted line down the, what we just call it, the dead center of that horse's hoof, that'll, that'll uh, determine lateral and medial balance. So from either side of that line, so the right hand side is a lateral and the left hand side is a medial, you'll be able to see if there's any imbalance. That should be, if you could measure that with a ruler, millimetres, you say, it might be uh, 65 millimetres on the medial from the outside of the hoof wall to the very centre line and it might be 65 on the inside. That's, you'll have a, that's how we find exact balance, lateral, medial. Um, also now, Dorso, dorsally, and parma. That's uh, from the toe to the heel. So those two red arrows down this uh, horizontally on the centre of the hoof, they represent the distal interphalangeal part of the hoof, which is actually um, known as Duckett's Bridge. It's, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of him. It's Dave Duckett's, and he, uh, for a lot of Research has found that's the exact centre of the horse's hoof, and if you were to drill through there, if you could, on your horse's hoof, you'll find the distal, the centre of the distal interphalangeal joint. That's how they found it. But um, looking at that, you'll know from dorsal palma, that's what we're looking at. So we're looking for 50%. Draw a square around around that horse's hoof, and you'll find any imbalances. So that's what I'm looking at for balance. So let's cut back. Okay, so that's that covered balanced hoof shape. Now the next dot point is workload. Is another main reason that you would most likely shoe your horse if you're working your horse or riding whatever you want to call it. If your if your horse is being worked maybe once a day on the soft surfaces, he may not need to be wearing shoes. But if you're working your horse, you know. Um, in the morning and of an evening on uh, or even once a day on an abrasive surface such as the bitumen or the side of the road on the rocks or even on some uh, arenas nowadays that are just have the sand before this uh, nice synthetic arena has started to take off, they will wear away their feet quite uh, quickly. So the workload has a lot to do with um, whether you're going to shoe your horse or not. Work surfaces like pretty much like I have covered like the bitumen's the main one because I can 
I'll be going to Sugar Horse and we'll pick their feet up and instantly I'll be able to tell you where you've been working your horse. A lot of the time if they've been working just in the paddock on the grass, you'll still be able to see the nail heads, the shoe won't be worn down, everything will be fine. But if they've been walking on the road, even once a week, for their, say it's done a five week or six week shoeing cycle, it'll um, have almost worn right to its shoes with a horse that has a tendency to slide its feet. So that's, a, that's something to consider. Now, nails in the hoof are not ideal, but necessary. Like I would have told you uh, as I open this, kind of slide with, with the difference between gluing and nailing and uh, barefoot. But yeah, nails are definitely one of the worst things you can drive into a horse's hoof, but uh, until we come up with something different, <coughs> it seems to be the only sufficient way, <coughs> excuse me, that we can seem to hold these shoes on tightly, especially for the amount of... Uh, weeks, usually five. I, I shoe all my, all my horses on a five to six week shoeing cycle, preferably five, because um, in the past we've been doing eight week shoeing cycles and by the time that the uh, fifth week had passed that horse's hoof was slowly starting to flare and by the time you got to eight weeks it had definitely flared out and it was starting to act uh, as an in detriment to the joint spaces further up the chain from the hoof. So we figured if we never got to that flaring stage we'll never get the uh, the uh, uneven loading on the on the joint spaces, so we decided to keep it at five weeks, and that, that is is the best way to keep the horse uh, the horse's longevity through their joint capsules. I feel, as from a farrier's perspective, and uh, it's been tried and tested. I know a lot of I know a farrier that's been showing clients' horses for over forty years, and he's seen the horses come to him as a foal and die of old age and he's now showing their progeny and he and he has said that, uh, that he's definitely seen it to detriment so five weeks seems to be really an ideal time. Four weeks is just too soon but five weeks seems to be just on the money. So we'll go to the next slide um, which I'll go back one. Okay now I know we're here earlier on the bottom right hand side but uh, we'll just, I'll just run you quickly through some of your horses Hoof capsule confirmation in the digit down, which the digit is known as the uh, the hoof or the, the the foot below the fetlock. All right, so we're leaving the cannon bone out of this, we're just dealing from the, the fetlock down. So the back, the very furthest left hand corner on the white diagram, you've got a horse that's toe in. Um, look through all of them. There, you got the straight, you got toe out, broken out. And it's not straight under there, and then you got broken in. And I'll just describe uh, how each one may have got to this stage, and just some uh, some ideas of what kind of things that you may uh, may come across with a horse with this kind of hoof capsule conformation. So we'll start with toe in. Now, toe in horses, uh, as you can see there, it's got a very vertical, um, almost straight up and down on the very outside of his hoof wall there and then on the inside, which is the medial aspect, it's starting to flare out. And that can be from the spiral, or from his cannon bone, that he can be spiraling, as we call, through the cannon, and then he can slowly pass down onto his into his uh, long pass and short pass into pedal bone. And the hoof capsule will only emulate what what is happening to uh, directionally from the pedal bone. And then the hoof capsule will flare if there's any discrepancies in the way that they are aligned. So you can see on a toe-in horse there, he's loading up his outside and it's that's straight up and down and it's flaring. So hoof capsule will always run to the area of least stress. So um, obviously it's getting a lot of pressure on the lateral heel because of the way it's spiralled or deformed and twisted and offset. And uh, it's the hoof capsule is all flaring towards the inside because it's um, the area of least stress and loading. That can come from basically improper maintenance as a foal, but I'll talk about that a bit more with the broken out and broken in because it's a bit of a better example. Now, the next one along there working on the right, you got the straight. Now, straight up and down is almost um, very rare, I find. They seem, you might have one in ten, I, I see, or almost none. Sometimes you might not see them for a long time. It's that it's it can be very hard to find a horse with very straight confirmation on the digit down. 
Um, and even if they they are, they will always they might walk on the side of a hill, and they will always end up with hoof capsule flares, whether it be lateral medial, dorso, or the heels running under from palmly, which is inevitable. You have to keep the horses' feet trimmed, otherwise they will always flare. But straight straight's kind of a um, a no-brainer if you're dealing with a straight hoof or straight confirmation confirmation horse. You won't have too many troubles. They got even even loading all around the hoof, which is ideal. So it's going to load lateral, medial, dorso, palmer, all evenly at uh, roughly the same time. Horses will always land a little bit heel first. Might be only be you know split second before they're towed, but it will land heel first. And once that heel hits the ground, the rest of the hoof will bear weight and it will spread evenly on a straight confirmation horse. Toe out, next one along. Yeah, obviously, it's the opposite to toe in, but uh, see how he's loading up his insides now. They're very up straight up and down the hoof wall, and it's flaring towards the outside. He might be twisted towards the lateral as opposed to the toe in twisted towards the medial. Um, now, he's, you'll end up with inside heel pain. That's one thing that I will say with this kind of a horse. He's already a horse of straight confirmation is going to be prone to loading up the inside medial aspect of his hoof wall because that's just where the center of the mass is going to travel first and then disperse to the outside but with a horse that's toe out he's already uh, predisposed to loading up his insides his medial aspect of his hoof usually his heel first because like i said they'll land slightly heel first and uh within that split second it will land further down the hoof but um because of that he'll end up with what we call medial heel pain or medial bruising within the seat of the corn, but that can be uh, monitored and it's basically a maintenance thing from a farrier's perspective. It will always grow like that because these growth plates have locked after nine, nine to twelve months, uh, nine or twelve months, and uh, once they have locked, and you're dealing with this kind of confirmation. It's a matter of maintenance, and it's, it can be easily done. It's just something that has to be looked after on a regu regular shoeing cycle. So, like I said, five weeks. Yeah. Even for trimming, we still do five-week trimming cycles. So we'll move down. You've got broken out, which is very similar to the one above it, like toe in, except you've got a um, the joint capsule has locked on an angle. So on this broken out set up here, you will have uh, compressed joint spaces on the lateral, uh, lateral aspect of the joint spaces on his distal interphalangeal. That's his... That may be his long pastern meeting his short pastern or his short pastern meeting his pedal bone. And because they are compressed on the lateral side and then they'll have a big, big gap on the medial aspect, they'll compress on the outside, pushing it up and expand on the medial side, leaving it open. And as they, they uh, lock off like that on, on the growth plates or they're otherwise known as the epiphyseal plates, uh, once they are locked, uh, that's setting concrete. So you will have to deal with that from then on. It's, it's something that's usually um, overlooked from a young horse kind of uh, at studs or even from the backyard as growing, uh, you know, like breeding horses. So it's something to really consider from a foal right up to, like we trim horses from foals at two weeks old and some with deformities will have glue-on shoes and therapeutic shoes, therapeutic, sorry, from uh, two years or uh, two weeks onwards. That's something to consider. I would always get a foal checked within two weeks, and uh, because you, you spend a lot of money getting a horse to in foal, and then you spend a lot of money with the foal after it's uh, popped out. And uh, if you have spent all that money and it only took you, you know, um, ninety dollars for an inspection and trim, or if you just fifty dollars for the trim, um, it's it's a small price to pay to for the future of your horse's feet because they can be locked off like this and you'll be dealing with these kind of shapes from then on that's set in concrete. Um, so broken, the uh, next one you got broken out, so we've got broken in is just the exact opposite to broken out. So he's he would have uh, had a lateral flare as a foal and his medial joint spaces will have compressed and his lateral joint spaces will be left um, uh, obviously not compressed, so the opposite <laughs> to compressed. And uh, they will be stretched in a way, like the uh, the collateral ligaments will have uh, 
being stretched and uh, being compressed on the insides. And once it's locked like that, then he's constantly going for the rest of his life will be dealing with this lateral flare because uh, because of the, the way that his bones have modelled, they'll always flare for that outside and that's going to be a maintenance problem. It's easily maintained, like easily maintained, but uh, it's just something to consider from a young horse growing up. Definitely. I think the thing, I think the thing with foals too, Jordan, is it's so easy for the owners to do it, uh, you know, just to file those feet when they do have that issue because a foal's feet, a foot is so fry, uh, you know, so soft and mm. we're constantly getting this uh, where people get us at about six months of age and go, oh, can you fix my horse, you know, my foal's legs? And they're like, well, no, <laughs> you know, you've left it too yeah, late. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it seems to be, and also like I was saying to you, Louise, earlier that because they're so, maybe after six months when you're thinking, oh, I might, might be trying to start thinking about trimming their hooves and the horse is starting to get, you know, it's getting a bit bigger, it's, it's starting yeah. to run around and feel its, feel its muscles and uh, <laughs> it's easy just to turn a blind eye and say, oh, no, he'll be right, he'll be fine but because yeah. there just seems a bit much to get in there with this young little colt or filly. Yeah. Yeah. But um, that's when you should definitely handle the horse from a young age because then you never have to deal with a you know a poorly behaved horse or something with a bit of attitude. Because if you're in there from day dot, you'll, um, one they'll be better off, and two you'll feel better around them. Okay, so the top picture there, you've got just looking down a, a hoof on his front foot by the looks, and uh, these red lines that indicate the one down the centre will indicate obviously the dead centre of the. Between the in between the bulbs, and it should be the centre of the frog, which will end up therefore carrying down to the centre of the hoof capsule. That red line in the centre will basically indicate that blue dotted line on the bottom right hand diagram. Should have carried it down the hoof. Okay, and uh, so that's fifty fifty either side on this hoof capsule marginally. I'd say it's probably a bit a bit more bold on his um, lateral aspect. But uh, then the um, horizontal lines are to indicate the bulb height, so that the top line is to be the, the very top of his bulbs and the bottom line will be where his bulbs meet his coronary band and uh, sometimes if that's an uneven parallel line, like they're, they're not, it's no longer parallel because it's been pushed off medially or laterally, that, that is, um, those bulbs are connected obviously to the hoof capsule and if one heel is higher than the other or one heel is lower than the other, because heels usually, whether they're high or low it's up to it's subject to, uh, to judgment really, but um, either way, if they're uneven, those bulbs are all connected so that one of those will uh, compress up, just like I was talking about earlier with uh, compressed joint capsules, very similar to this, so they'll compress up and when they compress up, uh, it, it, it affects the way the horse's hoof lands and disperses weight and basically concussion with every footstep. So it's good to, it's, it's it is uh, imperative to have pretty well uh, T-square, what we call T-square heels. It's you were to run a uh, centre line. This centre line was to continue up the cannon bone and run right down, the ruler right down to the end. And at right angles to that ruler, you'll have this very, uh, like where your heels, where your heels should run through. That's what we call T-square. And each heel should be at the same height. Um, if you're not getting that, if you, when you look down your horse's hoof, it can happen from um, improper or uh, incorrect uh, trimming or farrier maintenance, or it can be a conformational trait, which should be um, something very hard to kind of fix, but it's easy to maintain from a farrier's perspective, like things like broken out or broken in on the diagram in the bottom left. Because they're pushed up on the inside on the broken in diagram, these bulbs will be compressed, pushed up on the inside like on that red, on that diagram of the hoof capsule at the top. That's where you'll start to see that uh, discretion there. But without getting too in depth, we'll just keep moving. We'll go to um, a quite simple one, which is uh, why pick your horse's hooves out? Now, the great reason to keep picking your horse's hooves out, one is um, hoof inspection, I, I like to call it. like. If you are constantly hoof aware of what's going on down there, because um, the only time you're going to remain aware, I don't care, even if you're a farrier and you don't pick it up, you're not aware of what's happening, whether the shoe's still on tight or whether um, the, he's got a, a rock or a screw or a nail wedged in the crevices of his frog. Um, 
it's it, I find it's imperative to every time you ride, or even whenever you just seem to pick them out of the paddock, just quickly pick up their hooves and give them a scratch out because um, I've had even times where horses have just got a sharp pebble in the very cleft of their frog somehow. It's buried its way down at the bottom and the horse would probably be two out of ten, or two out of five, sorry, lame, um, which is a head bobbing at the gate. So it's um, something to definitely keep an eye on. And so the next one is uh, shoe inspection. One, you're going to see if your horse is in mud, you'll, you will find that the horse may be missing a shoe even if it's in mud. The odds are that it probably is because they seem to uh, suck them off or slip and slide all over themselves. But uh, I've been to clients' houses where you, they'll say, oh, this horse seems to be a bit sore on his near front. And you you'd say, oh, it hasn't got a shoe on its near front. And they go, oh. And by, the, by looking at the foot, we can see that it's been like that for a couple of weeks, so it's worn away at the hooves. So uh, just because they were never picking out the horse's feet, they never even saw that it was actually missing a shoe. Uh, okay, so the next one is thrush control and prevention. Picking the, the clefts of the frog out, of it, like free of mud, or will basically delete the problem of thrush. Uh, thrush is an anaerobic bacteria that grows in areas of minimal oxygen and minimal sunlight, which is ideal in the crevices of the clefts of the frog and around the sole, but mainly on the clefts of the frog. Uh, with, and as you can see there, the guy picking those out, that's the main area that you should pick your... That's the main area that I would always kind of address. Just quickly pick up the foot, dig, dig out each cleft, and maybe run a room around the sh <clears throat> inside the area of the shoe. And um, that would be take me about maybe five seconds per foot. But that will that will uh, massively deter thrush um, just having it out. And if as the, the hoof itself there remains a bit like more open to the oxygen, it's going to get a bit uh, harder, and therefore it won't wear away as fast, and the horse will be much more comfortable on those stony surfaces. Okay, and handling and exposure up is a very good all-round one. I can't think of one bad reason why handling exposure is a bad thing for a horse, uh, especially for young horses. If you're constantly picking up its feet and digging them out as a habit, and you do the same for your old horses as you do for your youngsters, eventually it's going to be a no-brainer for them and they'll think it's fine after even a few, a few days and they'll be fine with it. Um, so I think a lot of people seem to get away with not doing it because they think they're a bit scared or a bit sceptical of picking up the horse's feet or it's a bit too hard and they're too heavy, but that's because it's not done often enough. So uh, handling and exposure is great, especially for you. You don't be worried about picking up the horse's feet and the horse won't be worried about you picking up its feet, which works out great for the farrier. All right, so the next slide is that uh, I, I, this was a great idea. I seem to think from a farrier's perspective, we deal with... Um, a lot of pulled shoes, horses pulling shoes off, and nine or maybe eight, eight times out of ten, that's because of the environment that the horse is kept in. Uh, if any of anyone listening has a horse that pulls shoes, uh, the farrier will always blame the environment before he blames himself. But uh, it'll be a fact that it's either on the side of a steep hill. There may be um, the top line there. Uh, the bottom one, you've got muddy conditions, dams, swamps, or septic runoff, and uh, that's that's one of the main ones I feel is uh, imperative for keeping horses' shoes on, or even um, keeping horse sound. If there's uh, uneven, undulating ground, or there's uh, big, uh, so there's septic runoffs or muddy spots within the paddock, they're, they're horses and they run around playing and just oh, God knows what they get up to during the day when you're not there, but they will. Either strain the ligaments or boa tendon, that, you name it, if they can possibly do it to injure themselves, they somehow miraculously will. So I think the environmental factors of your paddock or whether it be stable are uh, imperative. Also imperative for uh, thrush and foot rot, like we talked about earlier, with picking them out. But if you can pick them out till the cows come home, those clefts of the frog. But if your horse stands in um, moisture, all day and he's standing in there, that paddock for 23 or 22 hours a day, um, it's quite easy to understand how thrush can develop and spread like wildfire throughout the, the uh, clefts of that frog there. You can see that 
horse's hoof that I'm holding up there. In the centre cleft, it's already got like a slight bit of um, like a dark, dark kind of crevice there. That's you would say is like the seat of where you get a real thrushy growth up and it run up between those two bulbs. And the more those bulbs move around on each other, they become very sensitive. Uh, so that's the reason to keep them in dry conditions. It's easier said than done, I know, but uh, just try your hardest. <laughs> it's, it'll be to great success. The other great one is loose wires on fences. Um, ideally, you'd have timber rail fences, but um, uh, you know, with loose wires on, say, just normal electric standoff fences, even they somehow will they'll push the limits and uh, they'll pour at the fence and uh, they'll either pour through onto the loose wire and rip a bulb or rip a shoe off, or that's the best thing if happen is they rip a shoe off. But uh, the worst case scenario, they'll catch it on one of their bulbs, and uh, I've seen horses quarter themselves time and time again from loose wires on fences. And they just seem to love pawing at those fences that I could not understand it. Um, and de yeah, so debris and paddock. It sounds like a no-brainer, but I see a lot of debris and paddock. This old corrugated iron floating around or um, anything. Somehow, somehow I even see steel pickets just sticking up in the middle of paddocks, which is just asking for trouble. But if there's anything in there, they are prone to accident. They will definitely hurt themselves on it, and uh, and uh, basically that'll work down the line to their feet usually. Okay, and losing shoes. I was just spoke about earlier. Losing shoes is uh, it goes under the radar. But um, if your horse pulls a shoe every time, those clenches that it's nailed on with, like the nails will go through and they're bent over into a clench. They have to rip through the hoof wall each time. And each time they rip through the hoof wall without being bent up properly uh, by a farrier, we, we cut those clenches off before we pull their shoes off. But if these clenches are left on and they keep ripping off those shoes, uh, it will be to the severe detriment of the hoof wall itself. And each time that it rips it off, if it pulls off hoof wall, we've got to keep nailing into new hoof wall. And before you know it, after the horse has pulled about three, three or four shoes, it's got next to no hoof wall touching on the ground. On the weight bearing areas of that hoof, and uh, it'll have to be either glued on or it'll have to go uh, have a spell until it grows down more hoof wall because it can't be nailed onto anymore. But that usually goes under the radar. People seem to think that, uh, oh, I pulled off a shoe, just seem to whack a new one onto it, but um, it's not always the case. Right, so we've got a few diagrams here of, um, of just some pictures of thrush, hoof abscesses, and uh, well, Louise is going to cover tetanus with you guys. I just wanted to, I, I put this um, slide in um, just to touch base on it because we we actually uh, have had a few horses, when I say a few, we've had two horses die of having a hoof abscess uh, and they get into dams and swamps and things like that and that's where that's how the tetanus is tracked in. So it's really important to have your horse up to date with tetanus, even if you're getting your horses shod, um, God forbid if the farrier is using rusty nails or anything like that, but any of those sorts of you know, traumas to the hoof can um, help tetanus track in and, and uh, infect your horse. So always have them up to date with tetanus, particularly if you've got, you know, horses that are prone to hoof abscesses or you have got them shot. So um, tetanus is the big one there. Uh, and hoof abscesses, just, um, I presume you'll touch on it, um, Jordan, just how often you'll see those marks on the hoof, uh, like that centre picture, and you can tell that mm. that's a hoof abscess. Yep. Yep, no drama, okay. That you're done there? Yes. Please, or do I? Yep, okay. Well, I'll go on to thrush, like, because we just covered that earlier. As you can see through the centre cleft of that horse's frog, it's, that, that will be the most sensitive area because those bulbs move independently, laterally, medially, and uh, that's it's hard to kind of understand, but they're very sensitive. It's like having a really swollen big toe and... Uh, from a broken toe or something like that, and if every single bit of blood flow through that, it, uh, it's just ever so sensitive, those bulbs are the closest part to the vascular system. They're very vascular and sensitive. If, so, anyone's, um, ever a, if anyone's ever have, had an um, ingrown toenail, I, I sort of put it like that, you know, how you get that yeah. throbbing, horrible pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. And it's a, it's a long road to recovery, I feel. Once they get to that stage, it's... it's um, so basically, it can be kept dry, and it, it doesn't uh, heal overnight. It can take um, weeks to kind of slowly 
slowly grow back. It, all the skin that's been worn off, it's like it's been sitting in there. It's like say you had a bath for about four days straight <laughs> and your skin just gets wrinkly and, and uh, kind of soft after about an hour, let alone sitting out there for those conditions for hours, especially if these anaerobic bacteria eating away at all the softer parts of the skin of the frog. But that can all be healed with uh, dry conditions um, and just constantly wire brushing and what, what uh, we have used in the past is uh, anything kind of to kill that bacteria, like the best one is sunlight and air through dry conditions, but um, we use that in conjunction with uh, a copper sulphate known as bluestone solution mixed up in water and we constantly spray it on the hoof and, and wipe it clean with um, cotton wool buds and things like that in between the clefts and clean it right out like a pressure pack of um, water with uh, copper sulfate through it just to blow all those de all that debris out from the crevices that you might not be able to get with a little with a little uh, wire brush and then just it's up to the owner from then on just to keep them in in dry conditions and it might sound easy but um, I'm yet to see someone that uh, goes the full like the full nine yards with keeping the horses feet dry they say yep they're dry we keep them in the paddock I don't, I don't see how he's going to get himself in any water and you go to the paddock and he drinks out of a dam, uh, but they say, oh, well, that's where they drink from, and you say, but well, that's where he's getting all the moisture from on his feet, because he has to walk into the dam before he gets a drink, um, which is a good one for it, and then they just stand around half in the dam, half not, or they sit in there playing, I see a lot of horses sit there pouring in the dam all day, they love it, <laughs> and because they love it so much, the owners seem to keep letting them do it, and they don't fence it off and let them feed out of a, um, let them drink out of a trough, which is ideal. So that's pretty well covered with thrush. Hoof abscess, as you can see, this one's through about the midway down its hoof wall. And this looks like, just from an outside looking in, it looks like he somehow just knocked his hoof and it's got this big kind of gouge out of his uh, center of his hoof capsule. But what that would have been was uh, it's either an abscess blowout when it would have started right up at the coronary band because abscesses will always blow out at the... Uh, the weakest part of the hoof wall, and if your horses have uh, nice strong hooves, or they're the strongest throughout the range of it, the softest part will be at the junction of the coronet band to the hoof wall, just like the top of your fingernail to your skin, um, and it will kind of push its way out there eventually through pressure, <coughs> but, um, <coughs> and then it will slowly grow down, and as you can see that hoof wall is about oh, a third down that abscess blowout. And you can divide that entire hoof wall up into 12 months. So from the coronary band right to the very tip of the hoof wall is a rule of thumb. You can say it's 12 months on most horses. It might be a month here or there, but it's usually about 12 months. So if that's to be a third of the way down, it'll be at about um, four months of growth since it blew out of the coronary band. Um, and yeah, it's just a good way to know when it, when it, when it happened. Uh, as a farrier, might be quite easily. So people say, "Oh, how long until that ugly hole seems to grow out?" With it, so I keep looking at about oh, or oh, nine months, and uh, just with each shoeing, you will keep on with the show horses. People will keep on asking, "How long till that hole just grows out?" And you go, "Well, it's been like a month since the last asking, so probably seven months now." But um, yeah, that's just the way it works. You can divide that up with a pencil, even into, into month periods, and that's usually within the ballpark of when it's going to grow out. And it'd usually be either at the coronary band or towards the bulbs. A lot of them will be at the heel towards the bulb if they blow out. Um, but uh, they can they can be extremely sore. So a good way to indicate if it is an abscess before it has blown out is they'll be almost foot hanging off the ground. They'll be, they won't even want to put weight on it. It's like you've broken a toe or broken your foot, you don't want to put any weight on it whatsoever, it's just too painful. That's usually, if that's instantaneous, that's abscess nine times out of ten, if they haven't injured themselves, that is, um, that we'll see. And the best thing for it is just um, we will kind of soak the hoof in like a warm animal intex or something warm. We can even, I've even sat them in warm water buckets because uh, the hoof is so malleable it'll kind of soak it all in and become quite soft anywhere. So if that, if there's all the pressure behind that hoof capsule, that um, abscess is going to blow out a lot quicker. So that kind of brings it on a lot quicker. And once it's blown out, the pressure's relieved and they can heal up <clears throat> quite quickly. 
but that's the that's the main way to get the blowout is to, is to get the uh, hoof as soft as possible. And uh, or you can have a rummage around, but if you can't seem to find it, if our, so if Aria cannot find it or your vet, it's um, it's gone travelling up the hoof wall, and you have to wait for it to blow out by bringing it on with a um, poultice. Well, we'll move on from this slide to um, white line disease uh, and CD toe and etc. The reason why we say etc. is because there's a f quite a few of them, a few names given to pretty much the exact same thing. So white line disease, CD toe, thrush, or um, this like a bacteria growth in the hoof wall. They're all very similar. Kind of the, the it's hard to tell the difference between the each of them from an outsider's perspective. But that, the, the first picture there on the left hand side um, that the whore, that the farriers are holding there, they say just looking at that picture, apart from the fact that it's got a ginormous toe flare. Um, we'll forget about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's got that, like I was saying earlier, it's that little bit of dirt in between the sole and the hoof wall. That's it. You can see a little bit of stretching of the white line there. And when that hoof wall kind of stretches because of that dorsal flare with the toe flare that I'm saying there, you get a tiny bit of dirt to kind of jam up in between the junction of the white line and the hoof wall, which is what you're getting on that, that dark little brown area. It looks like a brown line just behind that white line. But that's actually inside the white line. That And uh, white line disease is very similar to CD toe. It's just from the, the bacteria eating up inside the white line like I said earlier, the white line's a bit softer, or much softer, than the hoof wall itself. So that bacteria is going to eat up the, uh, the softest part, just like termites eat up the, the softest part or the, the best part of the tree from the inside. Same as the, uh, the bacteria in the uh, city toe or white line disease. And it, it can lead on to a whole range of different problems, but just to identify it and, uh, and maintain it or fix it before it goes the point of that picture on the right hand side where it's eaten away majority of its hoof wall this looks like a external bark sitting on the uh, petal bone there like that's a, that that'll take a long time to grow out and uh, the middle picture there it looks like a ginormous big horse um, apart from that the the fairy is not really at like you can say looking at it you can see in the heels there it's got seedy toe growth like a little bit of a seedy, thrushy kind of a growth going on there. Either way, it's an anaerobic bacteria that festers within uh, less oxygen and less uh, sunlight. So that's why it's kind of forming in those areas of the heels. And that will all be maintained by the farrier. Which each time he trims it with his knife, he'll sculpt all of that seed of the corn out, exposing it to oxygen. And pretty much from maintenance, uh, it'll constantly, it'll reappear, but each time it gets trimmed, it cleans it back out because it's just a natural crevice that kind of forms within the hoof capsule in the seat of the corn, and it just has to be constantly dug out, just as the crevices on each side of that frog, which he hasn't done yet, but he will do to keep um, any thrush away from the overlapping parts of the frog. Um, and the picture on the, uh, the far right-hand side, that's extreme seedy toe. Now, that's just happened from lack of maintenance and uh, only a couple of times I've seen it flare up that bad that it um, it can take off from that say that uh, middle picture and if it, the farrier doesn't dig it out properly and it's the time of year that it's quite wet and there's a lot of stretching in that hoof wall that can happen in up to five to eight weeks that kind of uh, that can eat away like wildfire it's uh, it kind of baffled me the first time I saw it eat into the hoof wall that quickly but it can happen, so the maintenance on that time of the year, like Queensland, is quite tropical, and uh, that time of wet season, and it's just coming off summer, and the horses' hooves are quite dry and brittle, and so they're left quite long, and they stretch apart from the lamina to the hoof wall. Uh, as soon as that first big rain, uh, it's not addressed properly by the farrier, uh, it can develop quite quickly. You'd be surprised. But uh, the best way to stop it from happening is just Every it's a consistent cycle shilling, so up to five weeks, six weeks of trimming or shilling, keep on top of those kind of things. But uh, with every time that you're picking your horse's feet out, becoming aware of what's happening down there, that there's a very minimal chance that they're going to occur. So, this is uh, another slide that I thought was pretty important. So, the importance of a qualified farrier. 
um, so the knowledge and like the knowledge and service is what you're paying with paying for when you get a farrier. You're not actually paying him to put uh, just to put a pair of shoes on your horse and, and just leave because eventually you could train a monkey just to whack a piece of steel onto a onto a piece of timber, say. But you're actually getting a qualified person that's been educated to know what's happening with your horse's hoof and further up the chain and ma what may happen if uh, if left in the circumstances that it was approached in. So what you, what people need to understand is that they're paying the farrier not only to put the shoes on but to give them an idea of what's happening with the hoof and how they're going to maintain it or what kind of work you're doing and how they're going to work uh, and and basically manipulate what they do to best help you in the future with your horse. It's a four-year degree, or a course, say, sorry, and it's a cert, it's called Cert 3 in February, which is done at the University or TAFE College, and then you can go on to seek further diploma, uh, kind of diploma courses, which I've done through, uh, as a companies, a few companies over in England, but uh, the reason why it's Pretty imperative for a farrier to get his diploma on top of his four-year course is so he, if he wants to go and work internationally like I will be later on in this year that our course is not actually recon recognized over there so it's, that's why I had to do it. Um, so the ideal shoeing or trimming plan to meet your specific horse circumstances now I say this only because some horses like I say rule of thumb is about five weeks but some horses may have to be up to two weeks. Like I, at the moment, I'm in Victoria now, working with thoroughbreds, and um, these horses are on a 21-day cycle, which is a three-week cycle. But some horses are on two weeks because those horses are monitored, and they we know that they wear those shoes out so quickly because the way that they land their feet and slide them, or they paw when they're in their stables, or uh, they grow a lot quicker, or they don't grow fast enough. It's all it's all um, Tailor made for that horse, so it's um, it's quite imperative that uh, you get a qualified farrier because they can see these things happening just through experience and being educated in it. Like uh, the next dot point down, you get the five to six weeks. Most pleasure horses will always be on five to six weeks. Um, I find eight weeks to be far too long. Like I said earlier, three week cycle for race horses. Um, and one of the biggest uh, reasons that you're going to get a qualified farrier is um, you may be able to get away with just your um, your average farrier that he's been taught from his parents which is fine or uh, you know, been taught by someone on a cattle station or somehow they've figured it out themselves but um, at the very beginning I taught myself on a cattle station and the more I knew the more I realized I didn't know and I still feel like it's just a yeah, a lot of the time you just feel like there's a lot more to be learned uh, with horses because they just can't tell you. It's just trial and error over the years. But with the specialised problems that you need that need knowledge is always a time when you're going to call a qualified farrier, like a hoof imbalance. you notice that your horse is constantly getting sore on the inside heel and uh, the cowboy that you got at the time can't seem to figure it out. Or um, your horse has an avicula or your horse has... Um, all kinds of problems, which, which uh, as soon as it becomes an anatomical question, the, the, the guys that haven't been educated will always fall down and you'll end up getting a qualified farrier, which might only be an extra $20 on top of what you're playing. Or sometimes I've seen unqualified guys charging more. I don't know, seem to have, I don't know how they've seemed to have uh, built up a hype. But um, it's always, I find it's imperative. It's like uh, getting a builder without a builder's license to build your house and then by the time it uh, falls down around you, you've got no leg to stand on because you didn't get a licensed builder. Very similar to a farrier. So um, I hope that has, well, I've got out of it there, but I hope that has basically shown you the ins and outs of the um, sort of day to day of a farrier and a few things that we come across. Um, any questions? I'm sure Louise will kind of go through them. Yes, I will jump in now. So if anyone does have any questions, just type them in there. Um, thank you for that, Jordan. That was very informative. Um, I've even learnt a few things um, tonight, so that's good. Um, okay, so we've, we do have a first question here from Rachel. What do you think about rocker shoes? Uh, rocker shoes, it's, it's, a, 
It is a tough question because I was saying that uh, there's a lot of trial and error and rocker shoes have been done and they've uh, come back into vogue, so to speak. But uh, some vets love them, uh, some farriers love them. Uh, a lot of farriers don't love them. But uh, what you're looking for with a rocker shoe basically is to get your um, your hoof past an axis to a, to a line for your... Um, your, your, uh, your, your basically your palmar angle of your pedal bone. So with a rocker, it uh, forms what we call as an air wedge. So as the, the foot rocks forward, it uh, its angles align and it seems to be fixed. That problem fix, we've got a positive angle instead of a negative palmar angle from on the ground of our pedal bone. But it's only there whilst a horse is standing on concrete. Now, what I'm this is just my opinion. Uh, it, there's a lot more. Uh, educated people which have different opinions to me, but uh, my opinion is as soon as that horse stands on soft terrain, like a stable, stable bedding, the, uh, that wedge seems to go out the window and it just falls into the, the terrain of the, uh, of the land or the soft, soft kind of surface underneath it. Um, but it, it, horses for courses, some horses react differently to different uh, kind of measures put on their feet. So. Um, for instance, we might have a horse with low heels and the, the kind of therapeutic shoes that we put on those horses doesn't seem to help it. And we'll try another option that we've used before on a different kind of a scenario and it will work for that horse. So it, you're constantly dealing with, um, it's, just, it's hard to say with each horse's specific needs, but uh, all around I'd say the rocker shoes have their place, but um, yeah, probably on hard surfaces I would say. But not in your arsenal. <laughs> no, they're not in my house, so. <laughs> and and my, for my uh, two bobs worth, I've only ever seen them on about three or four horses, um, mostly laminitic horses. One, I was astounded with how sound it was, um, but I only saw it for a month after the shoes put on and I didn't see how ongoing it was, but the other three, it did absolutely nothing for. It actually made them worse. So, mm. yeah, so I, I, I don't really have much of a view on them either. Um, okay, so we've got another question. How do you decide the number of nails to put in shoes? How do I decide? Um, yeah. Well, I, I would say that nine times out of ten, the maximum nails I would put into a hoof is six, and that's three medially and three laterally. But a lot of the time, the less nails I can put in, the better. Like, if, if there's less nail holes in the hoof, uh, the horse is going to be better off. So I, I always hot shoe um, and I hot shoe because of the clip, the toe clip or the side clips uh, that burn into that hoof wall. As they sear in, they're, they have, they're also acting as a nail in a way because it, when I burn on my shoes with the side clips, you can literally tap that shoe on with a hammer and it will literally just stay on the foot. Like it's, it's, it's like um, I always describe it to my clients as putting a mouth guard on when you I don't know if anyone here's fitted a mouth guard before but you or your kids mouth guards but there's a putty that you put inside the mouth guard and then you push it up into your gums and it molds to your teeth exactly perfectly uh, that's very similar to like the clip fit which I'll get to why we why we hot shoe but um, when you got that clip fit and been hot shod you can get away with four nails um, a lot of the time most of my front shoes I'll put four nails in that's two nails on the inside two on the outside and um, hind shoes I need as much uh, because there's a lot more propulsion going through their hind feet and there's a lot more wearing going on. I'll always put about five or six nails on those. Uh, Clyde's nails will take four, uh, seven nails, which is four on the outside, three on the inside, but their feet are probably the size of my computer screen, so the, yeah. the, the nails are minimal interference yeah. with those. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, another question, hot shoeing compared to cold shoeing, what's the Yeah. Okay, um, well that's all right because I was kind of already describing that. Uh, so hot chewing, you, what you're getting there is you're getting, say I find it almost impossible no matter how good you are, if you're to lift your rasp or a farrier, when they're rasping that hoof down to get it dead flat, they're trying to get that so like perfectly flat and if they can, which is almost impossible, but you can get it with 99% flat, um, and then you've got to get the shoe completely flat, perfectly flat, for, the, for there to be 100% surface area um, cover and match up 
from the shoe to the foot. Um, but if you're to get that foot pretty well, perfectly flat, as flat as you can get it, and then you get a hot shoe and you've shaped it up and, it, and then you, uh, you slowly sear it down, there might only be a three second burn. And because it's so hot, that hoof is made of uh, keratin. So it burns down and melts to the exact formation of that shoe, like the, the ground surface of that shoe will melt and perfectly match up with the, the foot surface. So any high spots or low spots will be um, evened out and they'll meet up perfectly, 100% hoof cover um, uh, in contact with that shoe. And you won't be able to get that if you uh, cold shoeing. And also the clip fit, clipping like the, the toe clip or the side clips for them to melt into the side of the hoof wall. Um, I've been cold chewing for the last three months down here in Victoria because these racehorses won't uh, stand up to the, to the being um, hot shod. And sometimes we shoot them in their boxes a long way from the car, so it has to be uh, just uh, cut in with a sharp little knife and then you, uh, best as you can, make that clip sit into the hoof wall. But um, from doing that, I've learnt that it is this, uh, the, the quality is nowhere near to burning on a shoe hot. Because it just is 100% surface area contact with the shoe, and uh, because of that, there's less movement in the shoe and uh, more contact with the foot, and it's by far a superior a superior product. And a lot of people won't hot shoe because they uh, don't want to. They usually use the excuse of, "Oh, the horses won't stand up to it," but if they're like privately, but it. Um, if private horses, it's different in the race industry because these horses may only come in there for three weeks and then we'll never see them again. But um, so it's imperative for us to kind of do it cold, with, you know, in a stressful environment like the racetrack. But to do them hot privately, it only takes one or two shoeings, and they'll eventually get the used to the smell. It's something not to be afraid of, and uh, with the owner there holding it after two or three shoeings, I'd say they'd be completely fine, and it's something that you don't really have to worry about. But a lot of people seem to, a lot of farriers or horseshoers seem to say that it's no good because um, I, I feel like they just aren't really up to the challenge of shaping a shoe hot over an anvil and then walking it over because you basically have to mimic that shoe, uh, the, the shape of the foot onto that shoe and then take it over to the horse's foot and burn it on it. It takes uh, about four years before you start to get your eye right into that. So it takes a long time to learn, but once you've learned it, it's by far a superior product. Um, another so question, aluminium, aluminium or steel shoes, pros and cons, which do you prefer? Uh, what was that, sorry? Aluminium or steel shoes, the okay, pros and cons, yeah. like, which do you prefer? So um, we would much prefer to put steel shoes on because um, it might sound funny, but uh, there's more can the shock will disperse a lot better through steel shoes as it does through aluminium. Aluminium doesn't compress or stretch by any means. It it more so will either shatter or um, or it just won't move at all. So if there's any for for expansion and contraction purposes or concussion, you'd always use steel over aluminium. But the only time that I will use aluminium over steel is when it becomes the weight problem. So if I want to put a um, a wedge like a swollen heel. Uh, on, a, on a shoe, or um, say I want to use a very wide web shoe, it's just going to end up being quite a heavy shoe if I was to make it out of the steel. That's when um, is, it starts to really affect the flight of the hoof when it's carried through the air, so you want it as light as possible. So then I will go for an aluminium shoe just to get it through you know, the, uh, the therapeutic stage that it might be going through, and then I'll go back to your steel shoes. Um, one for wear, they, they last longer, um, and two, like I was saying, with the shock dispersion through them. But uh, yeah, it's light, it's lightweight. Race horses all wear, they race in aluminium, it's a legal requirement. They have to race in aluminium in case they flip off and hit a jockey in the face. They've done it before and it would take a jockey's head off if it was a steel shoe, so they make sure it's all aluminium. Yeah. Um, now, I do have a comment, Jordan. Um, when you were talking about um, the farrier being the oldest trade, um, in history, you did break out, and we did hear you say something about prostitutes, and we just weren't sure whether you are a prostitute or whether you. Oh yes, <laughs> well, that's why I decided to become a farrier. But um, well, it was, it, yeah, it was quite amazing how the sound dropped out, and we thought it was prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> well, they say that the oldest trade, and I've only heard this, but um, it's from very trustworthy sources that the oldest trade. 
the oldest <laughs> in the world is um, prostitution. Now, back in the days of the Romans, they were sex was a trade. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, back in the days when you swap a block of cheese for um, I don't know, uh, someone's services for the day. But uh, yeah, prostitution before and after that was um, blacksmith and farriery. Um, oh, so, <laughs> yeah. There was one more point I wanted to, um, when you brought up about the hoof inspection and, you know, checking that there's nails and things like that, I think coming from a veterinary point of view, if you do find a nail in your horse's foot, the first instinct is to just pull that nail out. Don't do that. Um, and the only reason I say that is because you'll pull it out and you won't take notice, or if you are going to pull it out, take notice of A, how long the nail is, and B, which direction it was going into your horse's hoof. Um, because, you know, if you've got a, you know, two-inch nail that's entered that um, that hoof, just on the views that you've got on the screen there, that Jordan screen, you can see that that's going to potentially penetrate bones or, or very important um, structures in that hoof. So it's fantastic if you can leave it in there. Obviously, if it's just poked in, pull it out. But if it's embedded into that hoof, you're better off getting the vet out and uh, and having a look at it, getting a good look at where that um, nail has actually penetrated. So. Uh, we had one just the other day and the lady pulled it out and didn't bother doing anything about it. And we, um, two days ago, put her horse down because it had such a chronic uh, infection in the bone, because it, actually in the uh, navicular bone, which is that little bobbly bone at the back there on that picture. Um, yeah, the nail had actually penetrated through the, the, the navicular bone. So, yeah, so that's just my two bobs worth. Um, we might leave it there, Jordan, because I know you were struggling to when I said, oh, it'll probably go for an hour, and you are going, there's no way I can talk for an hour. Well, you've actually been an hour and 10 minutes, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Good point. Good point. Yeah. yeah, so um, we will leave it there. Um, if anyone does have any further questions, just uh, feel free to email me, um, and I'll get on to Jordan, and we can answer them. Um, but otherwise, I will call it a night, and um, we will leave it there. Thank you so much, Jordan. And, um, no drama at all. Talk to you soon. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. See you later. Thanks. Okay.